After his disastrous battles against Morgan and Greene in the Carolinas, Cornwallis found new opportunities in Virginia. Virginia was practically defenseless. Uh, they, they had lost their enthusiasm for the war in many respects. This was a huge state, 700,000 people in Virginia. And this little British army was just marching up and down the state at will. Cornwallis received support in Virginia from the newest British general, Benedict Arnold. Arnold, for some time, led forces in the Virginia area. He would uh, go into an area, destroy supplies, uh, get at the militia, try to bring the area back under British control. The British had made Arnold a brigadier general, but he was unsuccessful in attracting enough deserters and loyalists to complete his legion. After some months in Virginia, Arnold led a raid on the area in which he was born and raised. He burned familiar New London, Connecticut to the ground. Near West Point, Allied generals Washington and Rochambeau discussed battle plans. Washington wanted to attack Clinton's army in New York, but Rochambeau had another idea. Take Cornwallis on Virginia's Yorktown Peninsula. But Washington said, but what's the point? You know, the British fleet will come down and take him away. Rochambeau said, ah, not if the French fleet comes up from the West Indies and bottles them up. For the first time in the long war, Washington saw the opportunity to use naval superiority to his advantage. They sent a message by frigate to Admiral de Grasse in the West Indies. Acting autonomously, he made one of the most momentous decisions of the war. He decided he would take a gamble and come up, uh, even though it was a hurricane season, he could spare them six weeks, that's it. Washington arranged for the transport of all troops to Virginia. He tricked Clinton into believing the Allies were heading towards his forces in New York, thus rendering him and his huge army inactive. In South Carolina, Nathaniel Greene could take great satisfaction when he learned Washington was coming to Virginia for Cornwallis. We have been beating the bush, and the general has come to catch the bird. Nathaniel Greene. Not far from the Yorktown Peninsula, de Grasse met a British fleet on the open ocean off Chesapeake Bay in the battle that won for the Allies their needed naval superiority. Washington marched down to uh, Virginia, and bingo, the French fleet showed up, and they had Cornwallis in this beautiful little box at the end of the peninsula. I caught sight of General Washington waving his hat at me with demonstrative gestures of the greatest joy. When I rode up to him, he explained that he had just received a dispatch informing him that the grass had arrived. Comte de Rochambeau. Infantryman Joseph Plum Martin, now a sergeant after five years in the Continental Army, was one of over 16,000 Allied troops to enter Williamsburg, Virginia, in anticipation of the great siege to come. We prepared to move down and pay our old acquaintance, the British at Yorktown, a visit. I doubt not, but their wish was not to have so many of us come at once, as their accommodations were rather scanty. They thought the fewer the better the cheer. We thought the more the merrier. Joseph Plum Martin. The Allies started from Williamsburg before dawn on September 28th. By dark, they had surrounded the British at a comfortable mile's distance. 52 gigantic French siege guns would be devastatingly effective at that range. On the 10th of October, the Allies opened fire. The enemy threw bombs. 100, 150, 200 pounders. We could find no refuge in or out of the town. The people fled to the waterside and hid in hastily contrived shelters on the banks. 
but many of them were killed by bursting bombs and their houses destroyed. For the enemy fired in one day 3,600 shot from their heavy guns and batteries. Stefan Papp, German mercenary at Yorktown. On the night of October 14th, the Allies assaulted two strategic British redoubts. Alexander Hamilton, who had been Washington's secretary and trusted aide, commanded one of the attacking parties. Joseph Plum Martin was with him. We were now in a place where many of our large shells had burst in the ground, making holes sufficient to bury an oxen. A man at my side received a ball in his head and fell under my feet, crying out bitterly. The fort was taken in all quiet in a very short time. Joseph Plum Martin. With the capture of the two redoubts, the Allies moved to within 300 yards of the main British encampments. Cornwallis knew the end had come. Every American and French gun was blasting away at the British fortifications, and suddenly, up on top of one of the British parapets mounted a little drummer boy, and he started beating on his drum. And then suddenly, beside the little drummer boy stood a British officer waving a white flag. And they climbed down from the parapet, and they started walking across the battlefield towards the American lines, the little guy still beating his drum. And suddenly, there was total silence on the battlefield as every cannon fell silent. And everyone knew that it was the beginning of the end. I never heard a drum equal to it, the most delightful music to us all. Ebenezer Denny. Then Cornwallis had his letter of surrender delivered to Washington. I propose a cessation of hostilities for 24 hours to settle terms for the surrender of the posts of York and Gloucester. I have the honor to be, sir, your most obedient and most humble servant, Cornwallis. An ardent desire to spare the further effusion of blood will readily incline me to listen to such terms for the surrender of your posts and garrisons of York and Gloucester as are admissible. George Washington. For the first time in six long years of fighting, Washington could claim a victory against British regulars. Cornwallis did not appear at the surrender. His representative, General O'Hara, tried to present his sword to Rochambeau. The French general declined, indicating that Washington was the commander-in-chief. But Washington declined the sword as well, and had his representative, Benjamin Lincoln, who had surrendered the American army at Charleston, accept the enemy's weapon. Yorktown was the, the, the greatest British disaster of the war. The surrender was uh, a most uh, humiliating, of course, a bitter experience for troops who had fought under the colors of their regiments and had to surrender them. They could hardly believe that it was happening to them. They played a tune of the day. The world turned upside down uh, as they marched out. The mortification and unfeigned sorrow of the soldiers will never fade from my memory. Some went so far as to shed tears, while one man, a corporal who stood near me, embraced his firelock and then threw it on the ground, exclaiming, May you never get so good a master again. Captain Samuel Graham, British Highlander. I noticed that the Allied officers and soldiers could scarcely talk for laughing, and they could scarcely walk for jumping and dancing and singing as they went about. An American officer in Yorktown recounting the evening of surrender. In London, news of Cornwallis's defeat at Yorktown ushered in a new government, 
that was interested in ending the American War and concentrating on the war against France and Spain. In America, the great British defeat came not a moment too soon for the rebels. When Washington's aide, Lieutenant Tench Tillman, rode into Philadelphia to announce the Allied victory, the Congress was so destitute that its members had to reach into their own pockets for a dollar apiece to pay for his travel expenses. Washington was wise enough to know that you can negotiate better from strength than weakness, and he feared that if he discharged his army, England would take advantage of his weakness in the peace negotiations. In the two years from the end of the Battle of Yorktown to the actual signing of the Treaty of Paris, those two years in some ways were probably the most dangerous of any of the eight years of the Revolution. Washington moved his army to Newburgh, New York, where they waited in readiness through a long winter. In 1782, as a second threadbare winter approached, he warned the Congress of his army's growing dissatisfaction. The temper of the army is much soured and has become more irritable than at any period since the commencement of the war. George Washington. By early March of 1783, Washington pondered the problem in his Newburgh quarters. Congress had not adequately addressed the Army's grievances, and some of his highest officers had threatened revolt, a military coup. Every revolution except ours has turned on itself at the end and has devoured itself. Ours didn't, and it didn't because of the person of George Washington. Washington called for a meeting of the officers at nearby New Windsor in this large wooden building called the Temple. After some deliberation, he chose to address the group himself. He told them that they had fought for all of these years for freedom, but there was such animosity in the group toward the way they had been treated by Congress. He realized that he wasn't reaching them. And in one of those magic moments, he pulled a letter out to read to them uh, from a congressman to prove that Congress was indeed interested in doing what was right by the soldiers and by the officers. He couldn't read it. And there was a moment of quiet as everyone in the room looked up to see what was wrong. He reached into a, another pocket and pulled out a pair of glasses, and put them on, and said, Gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles. For I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. I don't believe anybody in the room heard the words of the letter, because in that moment, he, their commander for eight years, reached into the heart of every one of them. And witnesses say there was not a dry eye in the room. Washington realized that. He finished reading the letter, folded it up, put it in his pocket, and walked out. From that moment on, there was no longer any thought of uh, the army rebelling against the Congress. And probably in that moment, in that one moment, Washington had saved the American Revolution. <laughs>